Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Crypto Hot Seat, brought for you just for a change by tokenmetrics.com. Uh, this week, we are joined by Mr. John Paller, who is like any good interview subject, a multifaceted crypto being. Uh, John, we're going to talk about three things with John. Uh, ETH Denver, of which he's a founder and executive steward. Uh, his own business, Opolis, lots to talk about there. I want to learn about self-sovereign workers and what is what is a decentralized employment organization, and then uh, and then also uh, Spork DAO. So, John, thanks for joining us on the show. I guess the first question really ought to be: When do you sleep? <laughs> if you're doing all these things, <laughs> sometimes right in the middle of the day at my laptop when I'm trying to clean out email. I mean. It- Sleep is a precious commodity. It's very necessary. I do make it a point to get my at least six hours of sleep. So I I do have good sleep boundaries. But, you know, the six weeks after the beginning of the year leading up to Eat Denver is a little bit of a stretch. So yeah, yeah. uh, sometimes it it just has to go on borrowed time for a minute. To what extent do you actually get to participate in ETH Denver, your own conference, as somebody who's there to kind of like see the sites and go on the rides? Or is it, are you still doing hard admin during the event itself? Well, I'm doing hardcore community building. So most of my time, fortunately, isn't spent on the administrative like execution. Uh, We have a really deep team of stewards and meta stewards that execute various areas of the event um, that, that kind of get me out of the weeds, but I am spending a lot of time uh, building community of communities, relationships with other projects, with other protocols, with other events. And so uh, with, I mean, even with, you know, various stakeholders and investor types that are interested in what we're doing and it, it gets, I mean, the days, a week's not even enough time. So as far as participating in the actual, like, build-a-thon, I don't. I don't get to, but I do get to experience the event. So, like, you know, the trippy wall, we had a 150-foot LED wall in the parking garage this year that was just insane. You know, yeah, I got to go hang out there. I got spent time in the, the blockchain games arcade. I spent time in the makerspace. I spent time at you know engaging with our our stakeholder sponsors at their booths. I went to the the track hub. I went to the Jonas Buffacorn Biddle Brigade Gallery and and lounge. I went to all sorts of different things, but mostly I'm with people. You know, I'm with you know people from out of town. I'm I'm sort of multitasking, multitasking and trying to have meetings and sort of experience at the same time. Like I said, a week's not enough time anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, we used to try to collapse the, all of this into like a three-day weekend, you know, with like one overflow day on Thursday as sort of a transition day. Uh-huh. But we did this for almost 10 days this year and it was just bananas. So yeah, I, I, I get my fill. I mean, I, I certainly get to enjoy the experience. It's just from a little bit different viewpoint than your average attendee, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So read your loud and clear on... Um... 10 days obviously being a much bigger event than the previous weekend, long weekend in earlier years. Does that necessarily mean that like many more people are coming now? I'm I'm really curious. Please confirm or deny you had more attendees this year than ever before. By by a country mile. So we just produced the world's largest ever crypto event. Like we had um, almost 20,000 people apply to attend. Dang. And we had in Denver confirmed check-ins, almost 10,000. And there was a bunch of people that just airdropped into the city without tickets and without, you know, because they were on the wait list and whatnot. So we're, we're guessing somewhere around twelve to 15,000 in total in Denver. There was over 300 side events over 10-day period. So, I mean, it was... Yeah bonkers how much bigger it was than anything we've ever seen or produced before or frankly anything anybody's ever seen or produced before so um i think it's a testament to so we every year we have a theme that we've set out like 2019 was the year of DeFi. we were a year early you know 2020 was the year of the dow we were two years early 2021 was the year of the ownership economy and nfts and we were right on the money with that and then this year we called it the year of mass adoption 
And I think the numbers are a testament to that. It's bled over into mainstream, right? So we're not just talking about super cypherpunk tech heads or, uh-huh. you know, crypto nerds now. You know, we're talking about mainstream folks that are that are interested in what we call crypto curious. So we produce an event and content that caters to being a giant on-ramp for these folks. And it's been a huge hit. So now that you've... I guess we're we're right now about what two weeks out from ETH Denver being over. Are yeah. you are you just immediately back to some kind of chalkboard figuring out the next programming, or or to what extent yeah. do you get to unplug from doing this larger and larger event every year? About a week. I mean, we <laughs> went to Breckenridge for a week, and then we came back, and we're commiserating on like, how do we accommodate 20,000 people next year? Cause I mean, if that's the kind of demand that we had and we just couldn't fit everybody, I mean, yeah. we didn't have enough. We had 150 sponsors on the waiting list. Like tell me a place in a time that you would say no to 150 groups that want to give you money. Yeah. Have, like have, it, it was just, it was just mind blowing the amount of demand and we never, we've never seen anything close to this. You- so we are absolutely planning already for 2023. Uh, we have to. I mean, this yeah, is. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is not just like a, a, a cool conference. I mean, this this is literally the world's largest Web three social experiment in real time. I mean, it's a community innovation festival, is what we call it, uh-huh. and it's it's gotten so much notoriety and so much um, buzz around the different crypto spaces like Twitter. I mean, we had something like 30 million impressions over two weeks. I mean, it is just stupid (laughs) amount of traffic, you know, like it's all organic too. We're not paying for any of this, you know, it's just completely emergent in terms of like how it's being created. It's, it's really quite something to watch. So like, yeah, we don't, we're not getting a lot of time. We're actually right now we're spending our time hiring more people. Got you. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if you've ever, have you ever uh, been to Web Summit or paid attention to that particular operation? Like at a certain certain point, you need to get Colorado government involved. Like, uh, no? They're they're involved. I mean, the governor's already involved. Oh, wow, wow. Yeah, we have a partnership with the governor's office called Colorado Jam, which is experimenting in a technology sandbox with Web3 tech for the state infrastructure. Then damn, you're already there. Yeah, Yeah, we had had, in, in one room, Friday evening, I had the governor of Colorado, the securities commissioner of Colorado, Vitalik Buterin, Kimball Musk, and some of the brightest minds in Colorado academia around crypto in one room. Wow. Chatting about, oh, digital communities and DAOs and how we enable Web3 to the, be, you know, the, the next set of public utility tools for communities. I mean, where else can you do that, right? So we have the full-throated support of the governor's office. This is our third year in partnership with the state, and they love it. Uh, Governor Polis personally loves it, and we're just getting going. So, like, yeah, I mean, it's going it, to I, – I, I suspect that next year is going to be much more um, embedded in multi-levels of both state and local government. Like, I mean, the, the city's sort of been slow adopters and kind of getting getting on board with this, but now that we just – you know, the estimated economic impact of ETH Denver was somewhere around $50 million. And, you know, you can't ignore oh, that. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, the city is like, holy cow, like how much did you guys spend on this stuff? And it wasn't just us. I mean, we spent a lot, but like, you know, community of communities and hotels and food and transportation and all of these other things that come into, you know, this, this, uh, the city and state tax revenue, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's really big. Uh, I got one more kind of big picture ETH Denver question for you, and then definitely want to start talking a little bit about uh, Spork DAO and Opolis. Uh, but mm-hmm. to take take the audience back to uh, you know day zero of I'm the guy to start this thing called the ETH Denver. It's pre- <laughs> predominantly a hackathon, right? The the, the, yeah. the, the, mm-hmm. the hook wasn't we're a conference; it was we're a hackathon. Come build something in what you know some what, yeah. what, what were those parameters? Yeah, so we've we've we we actually actively avoid the moniker of conference because it doesn't describe what we do. 
Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, we're a community innovation festival, and mm-hmm. under that banner is the Biddleathon, right? So the Biddle meme, which everybody's seen, right? B U I D L. You've seen that, right? It's uh-huh. the the Ethereum version of HODL, H O D L, mm-hmm. the intentionally misspelled word. Well, we um, we put Biddle into the lexicon of the Ethereum community in 2018. And basically, it was during a, a bear market, and everyone's like, oh, hodl your coins, hodl your crypto, hodl your Bitcoin. And we're like, whatever, dude, don't hodl, biddle, right? So we created that hashtag and got a few million you know, uses out of it over a couple of years. And we're like, oh, that's stuck. And so it's always been about biddle, right? So I like to refer to Eat Denver as a giant tent with a blank canvas that invites people with, at no cost. So we don't charge for tickets. It's free to attend to come and express their unique creativity in a way that's meaningful for them towards this future of a decentralized internet, right? So it could be hardware. It could be makerspace. It could be art. It could be NFTs. It could be Mm. dApps. It could be smart contracts. It could be whatever they want it to be. We don't care. We have creatives and legal minds and non-technical people all over the place contributing to these projects. And the goal is to just let them be who they need to be. And we've seen over a thousand projects now come out of five installations of ETH Denver. We've seen some of the most prominent projects in the entire crypto space incubated ETH Denver. And it's quite a beautiful thing to see. So the community has no ulterior motives. There isn't tickets or extraction vectors. We're not trying to get anything from anybody. Uh, we're just trying to give people a place in a space to express themselves in 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 unabated ways, right? Which is thus the Community Innovation Festival, which is why the conference moniker just doesn't fit. Gotcha, gotcha. So where, where it came from is in the summer of 2017, we went from in 2016, like 10, 15 people at the Ethereum meetups to like 400 people at the Ethereum meetups. And a lot of these folks were software de- developers and technologists and entrepreneurs. And it's like, holy cow, like we should actually build something because, you know, we were flying people in as speakers from all over the world to talk to our meetup, but there wasn't really a lot happening here. And we said, well, look, with all this interest, with all this groundswell, we should do something with it. So I was the crazy person who said we should have a hackathon and I'll fund it. Right. Like initially, like we should go out and get some sponsors and stuff, but like we should put this talent to good use. And like, let's, you know, we had, we had talked a lot about Colorado being an ideal place for this sort of web three is just a bunch of tools for social change. Mm -hmm. So crypto is a tool for social change, but socially speaking, Colorado has a culture that fits crypto pretty well. Let's make Colorado a destination of choice for this web three development. And so the first installation, the goal, I think, was to have like 401 people was the goal because the largest event previously was like 400 people reportedly. So we just wanted to be the biggest. (laughs) It's sort of a dumb measuring stick at the time, but we just thought it would be cool. And we ended up with 1,500 people the first year. And that seems really small and intimate now comparatively. I mean, we had 3,000 people check in on the first Friday that we opened, which was almost a week before the main event starts. Wow, wow. So, I mean, it was bananas to see how much it's grown. So, do, so how, to, what, how, to what extent are you just like getting to hang out with uh, Vitalik Buterin that week? Does he, does he stay the whole time or is he just there for a day in dips? Mm-hmm. He was there all week. I mean, I, I have the good fortune to get a hang out with Vitalik quite a bit, actually. Um, awesome. In fact, you know, he messaged me on Saturday night of the main event saying, hey, wouldn't it be funny if I wore the Bufflecorn costume around tomorrow for a while? So we have a mascot that's a Bufflecorn, right, that runs around and takes pictures with people and stuff. And usually we just have one of our stewards do it or people volunteer and like literally I walked around with Vitalik for almost an hour taking pictures with people all the while nobody knew that he was in the costume, 
right? Nobody knew that he was in the costume. And then we had him go up on stage as one of the celebrity judges dressed as a buffacorn. And then he unveiled himself on stage in front of everybody on live stream as the buffacorn. I mean, talk about meme fodder. Yeah. I mean, Elon Musk, there was a, a web one, web two, web three meme that Elon had posted on the internet, on Twitter. And the web three was Vitalik sitting there in the buffacorn costume. Oh, right on. I mean, it was hilarious. Yeah. He got like 300,000 likes or something ridiculous, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, Vitalik is very gracious with his time and he is very benevolent to the community. And I've had the good fortune to spend my fair share of time with him, um, to, you know, pick his brain on ideas around gamification of things like SportDAO and mm -hmm. token economics and his vision on digital communities and what that might look like, even in the context of, things like state government. I mean, we had a, a meeting that we set up between he and the governor and, and myself and a few others and talking about these topics. I mean, it's just mind blowing the, the opportunities and, and intelligence that, that comes from, from this community. And, you know, Vitalik is what I would call a very benevolent, authentic, sincere leader that takes his role very seriously, but doesn't take himself too seriously. Yeah, sense. yeah. I'm a, and at the opposite end of that spectrum is probably like Linus Torvalds, for example, who who absolutely takes himself very seriously and is kind of famously. Well, there's, yeah, there's a bunch of that around. I mean, I don't particularly want to name drop who I think is in that corner, but the Bitcoin community has quite a bit of sure. it. Sure. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. There's plenty of it in in alt chains. You know, other layer ones that you know either sought or are seeking to displace Ethereum. Um, there's lots of ego stuff. And quite frankly, I've never experienced that from Vitalik, which is part of the reason why I'm, I'm so bullish on the Ethereum community and, and not just Vitalik, but the community itself, because the community is really focused on building and, and couldn't really care too much about optics mm -hmm. or cool kid club stuff or whatever. I mean, yeah, there's some of that that goes around and there's always some of that permeates you know, you're not going to stop it, but like, but the community vibe itself is very focused on contribution of value and building. Right. Well, so uh, let's, let's talk about SporkDAO and, um, and Opolis now, because outside of ETH Denver building that, you also are quite involved in these two other projects. Do it, set, set me straight on the chronology here. You had already started, um, you had already started Opolis before, uh, before mm. kicking off ETH Denver. Is that right? Yeah, about six months. So Opolis was started in August of 2017. And um, it, it came after a series of events and experiences that I had in the Web2 startup world. And I had called it an epiphany, if you will, around the way employment is organized and the game design of employment, both from a legal and just hierarchical incentives, etc., and I had a realization that the way that I was going about trying to democratize employment in the Web2 world was never going to work. And it was really time for a hard reset. So this all happened in probably 2016 when I had this, you know, we call it the red pill moment, right? Where you go down the rabbit sure. hole and you can't unsee what you yeah. see. And then I spent the next 18 months exiting a, a business and, and, you know, resetting sort of some, um, some startup stuff and returning some capital to some investors and then, and actually founding what is now Opolis and, um, the original vision for that, um, was hatched in 2017. So that was about six months before the first installation of ETH Denver. And to be perfectly honest, when Opolis first started was, was founded, there wasn't a lot of, I, didn't, I wasn't connected in the space. I didn't know any developers or, you know, web three smart contracts folks or anything like that. So I was like, you know, I was connecting at a pretty high level with guys like Joe Lubin and Vitalik and they were pointing me to some other folks that were in like Toronto and New York. And I'm like, God, we have all this stuff here. There's gotta be some really smart developers that can help us here more locally. Cause we just weren't equipped yet for a, a like a remote first work environment. Mm -hmm. I think we were making the steps that way. So selfishly, we wanted to find some devs, right, for Opolis. 
and then it just took on a whole life of its own. And of course, you know, Opolis has, has done very well, but the community did even better. Right. So, um, yeah, so Opolis was started first and then East Denver and then Sporked Out was created in the uh, spring, early summer of 2021 as Opolis became, or excuse me, as um, East Denver and the other meta DAOs became community owned. Mm -hmm. So what exactly does Spork DAO do? Or no, let's not start there. Let's start with Opolis because I broadly understand that this is this is payroll yeah. software, but there's a blockchain component. What what am I missing? How can you clarify that? Better? Well, it's yeah. It's so it's funny because a lot of people think that the solution to the the, the world's woes lies in tech, and what I always say is like, look, tech are great tools to solve social problems, but you really have to look at the social fabric of things in order to solve the real social systemic issues and use tech as, as a means or a tool to, to create sustainability. So what Opolis really is, is a public utility infrastructure for employment. Uh -huh. Now, what that means in layperson terms is if you prefer, it's a member owned employment cooperative. Uh -huh. So what it does as it's at its core is it provides a lot of the same services that you would see or call them shared services that you would see at a lot of other payroll companies like you know, semi-monthly or bi-weekly payroll processing, reporting, compliance, tax withholdings, benefits administration, et cetera, et cetera, except our customers are not corporations. Our members are independent workers. So what we've done is if you know what a professional employer organization is in the world of web two, that's like a, a business process outsourcing function for employment, right? So there's a legal designation called employer of record that these PEOs take on for small businesses and their employees to streamline their HR and their payroll functions because they don't have the resources internally to do it themselves. But what we're doing is instead of focusing on small to medium sized businesses and aggregating a bunch of headcount through corporations, we're doing it directly to the individual worker. So all the people that are 1099 can now get a W-2. All the people that are 1099 that don't have access to quality health care mm. can now get group, group health care insurance. All of these people that are, you know, having to have different employers for different gigs and on this, all this, this musical chairs yeah. nonsense. A self-sovereign worker owns their own employment. So now it doesn't matter where the revenue stream is coming for them. They don't lose their health care. They, they get the same W-2. They get the same page stubs semi-monthly. And it feels, looks, and acts just like regular employment, except they don't give up their Yeah, now this idea is really, really, really connecting to, with me because I have quite a few years under my belt as a freelance writer. And uh, yeah, that's, that's so that's, normally what are you going to do, right? How are you going to get health care? How do you get a W2? Yeah. How do you buy a house? How do you refi a house? How do you do any of this? Yeah. Thing, yeah. Right. There's, we've created the, the hierarchical model, the parental model of employment has really, you know, it, it handcuffs people into sticking around in these, these subjugating models. Right. And if you want to take the leap, to be independent, it comes at a cost, right? Because you got to figure out all these things on your own. So what we've done is aggregated all of these different things into one platform. And as a member, you're an owner. Mm -hmm. So just like REI, when you go buy your skis and your camping equipment, at the end of the year, they send you a check for a profit sharing. We do the same thing through our token economics. Huh. So as, as a member, you're an owner. So now you have interest in seeing it grow, which means what are you going to do? You're going to refer your friends Help grow it. because there's, actu you're, there's actual economic incentive to doing that. And it's all done through our process called payroll mining, which is a whole nother subject, probably a whole nother podcast. Yeah, yeah, perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't want to feel like we're cramming, but uh, I do want to talk a little bit about Sporkdown and then probably wrap this thing up. So... So, sure. John, please walk us through SporkDAO, which is like a, your your third uh, your the third thing sticking out of your head. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's sort of very closely related to ETH Denver. So SporkDAO is um, so we pioneered 
a framework using the legal wrapper of a Colorado cooperative. Mm -hmm. So both Opolis and SporkDAO are Colorado co-ops. And what we've done is we've we found a legal path to tokenize these communities that aren't securities, right? And it's specifically related to the fact that they're co-ops because there are exemptions for cooperatives in the state of Colorado around securities registration. So SporkDAO is the um, the master DAO or the master cooperative that owns three meta DAOs. But before I get into that, the Spork DAO is tokenized through a token called Spork. It's what we refer to as a patronage token, which is a co-op term. And we've tokenized patronage such that when there, if and when there's a profit like REI, the checks that you get at the end of the year, instead of a paper check, we're issuing these tokens and um, dividends to token holders via a very specific process, right? So you have to be a member, you have to be active. There's a few check boxes that you have to check for legality reasons. But um, in essence, it's not a security, right? Because this is a very common practice. Cooperatives have been shipping profits back to their cooperative members for hundreds of years. This isn't new. So um, SporkDAO is the master community. Now, under the three that the Spork DAO and the Spork cover three meta DAOs. And these meta DAOs are ETH Denver. So ETH Denver is one DAO that basically exists to host the annual um, stakeholder meeting, which is ETH Denver, uh-huh. right? So in terms of the bylaws of Spork DAO, we're required to have an annual meeting. Well, guess what we do? We just call ETH Denver the annual uh-huh. meeting, right? So anybody who attends, there's, there's a, small bullet point list on how you become a member. We're actually codifying that and making it a little bit more clear for next year's event. But essentially you um, come and attend and participate and contribute. And that's our stakeholder meeting, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Every year, the goal of ETH Denver is to biddle, as I said, and historically our community has never taken a position in any one of these companies that's been incubated in our event. So in other words, we've never accrued any value back to the community, right? So if we had put a $50,000 investment into pool together, right? Imagine what that would be worth today or one inch or POAP, right? These are, these are all projects that were like super early stage at ETH Denver at one point or another. Well, to, collapse the loop or to create the full cycle of value accrual back to the community because we put a lot of value out right it's free and we put out all these scholarships for people to come and everything's open you know come and create this stuff but like how do we create sustainability so we're now through the other two meta DAOs investing in projects that come out of ETH Denver to do two things one is called Colorado Jam which is the partnership that we have with the state of Colorado and Governor Polis's office it's a technology sandbox and incubator to pilot, test, experiment, and incubate early stage technology of Web3 in the state infrastructure. And it's all privately funded. We don't take any state money. It's just we have an open door and a blank canvas to kind of, you know, experiment, test and see what works. That's and that that entity is also funded by the third meta DAO, which is called Buffacorn Ventures. So it's a community investment DAO that is non-custodial. It's operated through a Moloch DAO framework that basically um, people, accredited investors can contribute to this pool of funds. And as we make um, strategic bets, we're making them on projects that are coming out of ETH Denver. So there's no event space in the world creating more early stage alpha than we do. Yeah, like we have hun- hundreds of projects that come out of ETH Denver every year and we get to see them before anybody else does, right? So historically, we've never put any bets on these companies. We've never given them additional funding. We've never taken a position. Now we are. So um, we're very founder friendly. So we don't put onerous, crazy board seat crap and warrants and other stuff. I mean, a lot of this operates like convertible grants, which is basically if your project doesn't make it, we don't expect anything in return. Uh, there's no debt. We don't hold people's feet to the fire. The whole goal is to activate the community around these promising projects 
so that they can accelerate with tools, resources, capital, and support to get to the next phase, which would be kind of a seed round funding, right? So we're like first money in before seed seed round type of stuff. To what extent is uh, ETH Denver on the on VC radar? Uh, like, are there are uh, we had like three hundred and fifty of them show up? This okay, last okay, wow, wow, just two weeks ago. Uh, oh yeah, we are we are we are like the Super Bowl of crypto alpha when it comes to like VCs and what they're looking for. So this is part of the reason why we put together Buffett Corn Ventures because we know projects are going to get funded and we want the community who puts so much time and effort and money into this to, to be, you know, benefactors of some of these projects that do really uh-huh. well. Yeah. Right on, right on. Uh, yeah. Super interesting, man. I don't know. Like did, when you were starting this uh, five years ago, did you ever think it would be as big as it was this last time around? Could, did you ever see that? coming? Uh, you know, I'm a big dreamer. So I, I would lie if I said that I didn't sort of, you know, muse about like thousands of people running around, you know, dressed as bufficorns and doing all sorts of really crypto weird stuff. But, you know, to see it is a different thing, you know, and I'm, I'm just grateful to be a part of it. Like, you know, it really has taken on a life of its own. Like there's so much cross pollination and collaboration and communities of community stuff going on that like, I, I don't even see everything that's happening anymore. I mean, we have over 50 stewards that like help contribute to core operations. And then we have layers of meta stewards and other volunteers that layer into that, not to mention our stakeholder um, sponsor groups that also do stuff. I mean, we had puppy petting <sighs> all sorts of other just, you know, side events and crazy stuff going on, like concurrently, like it's so much that like, if you can't find something that's interesting to you, I don't know what you're doing, but like, it's, it's pretty wild. So, you know, even for me, it's, it's, you know, blows your sprockets, but like, I'm just happy to be along for the ride. I mean, it's been a ton. So I want to kind of, I want to kind of jokingly ask you, but also seriously, are you, are you good or bad company at other crypto events? If you're, if you're at BTC Miami, are you like, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm the, I'm the worst critic. (laughs) Like, you know, I, I, I have a tendency. It, well, it depends. If I'm at a, if I'm at a Bitcoin event, like I'll be, you know, kind of, judgmental and if i if i'm if i'm at an ethereum event like in lisbon or or even even some sort of evm you know virtual machine compatibility thing where there was a bunch of that going on in lisbon and paris like i'm cool you know like look everyone's gonna do their own stuff and you know we have something very unique and special in eth denver and Quite frankly, I don't care if they don't live up to our standards. It's just better for us, right? So, but there are times that I get cringy about certain things that happen, especially at Bitcoin events. Like, you know, I went to Consensus 2018. I've been to NFT NYC a bunch of times. Like, I've been to BTC Miami once, you know. I didn't go this past year, but like, I've, I've seen it, you know. And like, I'm not terribly impressed by it. And I think the priorities um, for us, for me, the priority of Biddle, like the building, is so important to keep that as the focus because we have such a long way to go when it comes to adoption and all these other variables that like, you know, nothing is sealed as far as our success goes. So like we have to keep focused and we have to keep our heads down and keep humble, like the whole flashy you know, some of the the stuff that I've seen on stage at at some of these Bitcoin conferences, just, I just don't get it. I'm like, what are you doing? You guys make us look really silly. You know, the the average person watching this stuff is not going to be impressed. So like, we just try to keep a lower profile and just say, look, we're just going to build and we're just going to keep our heads down and we're just not going to, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want anybody from the, I mean, if we're really trying to take this mainstream, we've got to appeal to regular people that don't know about this stuff and yeah, at least yeah. perk their interest to want to learn more. And I think some of the showboaty stuff, 
I think I just think it's the wrong approach. I it's to me it's very ego driven and just not helpful to like creating more interest, you know, which is why we don't do a lot of those things. We did have the Doge Claren though. I don't know if you saw that, but we had a we had a McLaren that was wrapped with Doge like wallpaper. Right on. And it was it was quite the hit. Um uh, that shout out to Gary's Chance and, and the crew that brought that down, but um that was fun. But you know, but we didn't do a lot with it. It was just kind of sitting around and people would take pictures with it and stuff. Every, you know, nobody was I like I wasn't out there posing. Every little bit helps. Back. Like you're talking about mainstream tipping points, and I'm convinced that that's in the near future. And it's events like yours that are part of it, uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, I, th- I, I think, think it's certainly. I, I think so too. Uh, I think so too. I, I, the one thing I'll put a punctuation on that. Yeah. I know we're running out of time, but I think it's important to reiterate this, that, you know, Eat Denver is not a conference. It is a real life web three experiment, like in real time, right? It is, you're experiencing token economics, you're paying for food with crypto, you're building web three tech, you're experiencing NFT art, you're experiencing the metaverse, you're living this stuff. It's, it's like a glimpse to the future. It's, it's like the world's largest web three social experiment in real time. So it's not just like we go and talk about the tech like a lot of these conferences do. We're actually doing it. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, that's the thing that I think differentiates the things that we do almost compared to anything else is because we spend so much time on the experiential side of it. That's the thing that, that most people come away with. It's like, holy cow, that was so immersive and so real and so in my face. I've never been to anything like yeah. that. So which is why... I think we have such a repeat. Crack. Is it is it a uh, is it too much of a stretch to draw any comparing connections to Burning Man? Like they talk about this, like like living in building a better world, and then actually going out and doing it for however long it is, four or five days. Yeah. Well, so my friend Kevin Awaki talks a lot about regenerative versus degenerative economics. Mm-hmm. So degen versus regen, right? And I think, unfortunately, if you look at the economic cycle of Burning Man, there's a lot of money spent. And a lot of things that go on and a lot of things built, but the, there's no cycle, right? There's no uh, regenerative nature of that, uh-huh. right? So what we're doing in Web3 is we're adding a new component. We're adding regenerative economics and, and sustainability to these ecosystems. So for me, it's, it's like from a creativity standpoint, from an expression standpoint, from a hum- human standpoint, it's very similar. But I think it takes it to another level. I think the technology, the art, the combination of all of these things, plus the economic model takes it to a whole new level of opportunity. So uh, if you like things like Burning Man, the organic sort of like authenticity of those kinds of experiences, then, then I think it's, I think it's great. You know, I think you'll like it a lot, right on. Um, but it's even, it, but it's even deeper, you know, it's, it's, it's really crazy to experience it. Right, so this is a once a year thing. We have we have to wait another year if we've missed it this time around. For now, so um, there is a possibility you might hear about this little thing called Spork Fest. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're toying with the idea. It might not be a twenty twenty two thing, but um, Spork DAO is expanding, and um, Spork DAO is is going to be um expanding likely outside the walls of Colorado which is our main focus right to build Colorado as the destination of choice for web3 innovation uh, to live work invest build here um, but there's been so much demand for sport Dow's involvement in other events that you know we very well may start by lending our brand and some support but also getting into like where we might actually produce, some other community innovation festivals across the globe in different capacities. So more to right, come. Right. Looking forward to following it and, and chatting again in the future when, uh, when there's some new interesting stuff to talk about. But in the meantime, John, thanks for uh, sharing a little bit of time with us today. Really appreciate this, yeah, my uh, pleasure. this educational and edifying conversation. Uh, so yeah, that's our guest guys, uh, John Powler. He is the founder of Opolis the executive steward of Spork Dow, and, and wouldn't you know it, he's the founder of ETH Denver. He's taken a little bit of a break, for, er, but not for long, but not for long. We've established that. I'm going to go I'm gonna go get some yeah, sleep. Yeah. Enjoy. Anyway, <laughs> thanks, John, and uh, we'll talk to you. Thanks for having me, yeah. Dylan.